Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. Hey everyone, welcome back to our little third uh, installment of our Q&A podcast, which people have been very, very uh, grateful for and excited for, and I'm happy to do them. I'm glad that the questions are resonating with people and that they're finding them super useful. So uh, we are going to go into uh, another area that I get a lot of emails and a lot of questions about from you know parents or coaches or um, medical providers saying, you know, I work with this gymnast or this ballet dancer or someone and they really struggle with flexibility. You know, how do we get more shoulder flexibility or hip flexibility for splits and jumps or pike flexibility? Uh, a lot of different areas of flexibility people are curious about. And so I took, again, five questions that uh, kind of represent the most common things that I get asked about over the course of a couple of months and put them into this little uh, checklist uh, checklist that we're going to go through and, and just kind of talk about a little bit here. And so the first one here comes from Jill. Uh, Jill says, hello, my daughter is eight. My daughter is eight years old. And although she is very naturally strong, she struggles with flexibility. It's mostly in her hips and her shoulders, which makes her handstands, back handsprings uh, and leaps hard. She gets deducted for le- uh, ankles and leg separations or bent knees quite commonly. Um, what can I do to help her? So this is an extremely common question that I get. So, you know, sounds like uh, her daughter is younger in gymnastics. She is working on, you know, maybe some compulsory levels. I'm not sure. It sounds like back handsprings, handstands, basic leaps and stuff. And she's growing and it's really hard to get um, the flexibility she needs to not get stuck in skills or to safely do back bending and things like that. So um, the first thing I always tell people when I talk about flexibility is that there's actually a lot of things that could possibly cause someone to not have um, full uh, shoulder flexibility or hip flexibility or bridge flexibility, right? So although it seems simple, like, like, oh, just get your shoulders open, let's stretch your shoulders. There's a lot of different muscles, there's a lot of different bones and uh, joints and things like that, that could be influencing someone who doesn't have their flexibility. So the first thing we want to do is we actually want to spend some time screening someone and figuring out which of the things might possibly be the factor for why they don't have full shoulder flexibility or hip flexibility. So if you don't take time to break that down and you just kind of start doing exercises, you might actually be wasting quite a bit of time and you actually might not be making progress because you're, you're maybe applying the wrong solution to a different problem, right? So I always make the analogy with people in gymnastics is, so say someone can't make their giant on bars, right? Uh, and you say, okay, I, I'll help you, but like what I have to, I have to see your giant first and think about what the problem might be. So maybe it's a problem with their kit compression. Maybe it's a problem with their body tension. Maybe it's a problem with where they're looking. Maybe it's a problem with where their toes are and their fall shape. Maybe it's a problem with how long they're holding their arch kick. Maybe it's their shaping over the top of the giant. There's a lot of different things it could be. And there are different drills to fix those specific technical problems. Same thing here. There's lots of different things it could be for her flexibility. And we want to break those things down. So I'd work with the medical provider, or if you're a coach or a strength coach who really understands this stuff well, put someone through some specific screens to look at lat flexibility or Terry's major flexibility, thoracic spine flexibility. Maybe it's an active flexibility thing where their strength and control of their upper back is just not working during a skill and they need more strength exercises. So do that first is look at, you know, uh, the shoulders and the hips and break down what it might be. So you have specific exercises for those things for the hips, right? This sounds like it could be her hip flexors. It could be her quads. It could be her inner thigh muscles. It could be um, the strength of her outer hip rotators and her glutes. It could be a core control thing. All of those might be possible reasons why someone doesn't have great flexibility because as young kids grow, the long bones grow faster than the muscles can keep up with. And so that's typically why you see someone get tight. But also, as you repetitively train in exercises for gymnastics, sometimes certain muscle groups get stiff as well. So you can screen those out. You can figure out what's going on. Once you have a few things to work on, I think the biggest thing to consider is that you want to look at the research and say, okay, what do we have some support of in the research to make people improve their flexibility? Okay. Stretching does work. A variety of different types of stretching work, right? So static stretching, PNF stretching, um, dynamic flexibility, those things do work if they are consistently done every single day. So a review by Thomas in 2018 looked at the duration and um, types of different stretching you need. And static stretching was um, significantly statistically significant to increase range of motion if you did something five to six days per week and you held those stretches for two rounds of 30 seconds, okay? Same thing with dynamic stretching or PNF stretching. They work if you consistently do them every day and they're based off of a screen that says those things might be what you need. 
So you can work all the different exercises you want as long as it's based off a screen and you're doing it consistently every single day. So for this situation, I would probably have someone do some sort of soft tissue work like foam rolling or some light rolling out and then do some uh, specific stretching every single day, about two to three sets of 30 seconds for those muscle groups in a circuit. Okay, the other thing I would have someone do is do some sort of eccentric contractions, right? So a concentric contraction is when you flex your elbow and it comes towards your body. An isometric contraction is when you just hold one static position. An eccentric contraction is when some of the muscle is opening or a joint is opening and you're lengthening as you contract. And I'm not going to dive into the research to make it, you know, a little bit more of a shorter answer, but eccentric contractions under load, like with dumbbells or with your body weight, we think have some support behind them to help increase the length of muscles over time through a process called sarcomyogenesis, where uh, stretching and foam rolling and massage or dry needling or cupping or tool work, those kind of just reduce the tone of muscles temporarily, the short term uh, relaxations. They're not actually making muscles longer or tendons longer versus exercise, loaded exercise in proper done strength and conditioning uh, does actually hopefully increase length over time. So I would be doing some sort of screening, some sort of soft tissue work every day for those areas that they find in the screen, maybe the lats or the shoulders or the pecs, um, the hip flexors, the groin, the quads. I'd be doing some sort of eccentric work for the shoulders. So I really like jump up chin up lowers right all the way down. I also really like split sliders. So your front leg is on a split on a slider and you're slowly sliding out and then using your hands to push back up. So it's only the eccentric forward and sideways single leg Romanian deadlifts, um, single legs, uh, rear foot elevated split squats. Those things stretch out the hips pretty good when properly done. And I would do five repetitions of a five second lower with a five second hold every single day before practice. Okay. So that would be my recommendations. I would go through a screen. I would do some soft tissue work. I would do some stretching every day. I would do some eccentrics. I would do some strength conditioning for the outer hips or the upper back. And then I would also maybe try to adjust some of the strength conditioning they're doing in the gym to make sure we're not doing too many exercises of the same muscle group over and over again. So it's very common in gymnastics to have someone who maybe has tight shoulders, tight lats and pecs to do leg lifts and pull-ups and rope climbs and lots and lots and lots of, of lap-based exercises and just continue to feed that fire a little bit. Same thing with the quads and the hip flexors and the groin. If they're squeezing their legs together and keeping their legs straight for good form, they do a lot of squat jumps, a lot of jumps in the air and a lot of different sprint work. It might make the quads and hip flexors quite stiff. Maybe we can switch that out for a deadlift or switch that out for a hamstring exercise or switch the shoulder pull-ups out for upper back rowing exercise and try to balance out some of the flexibility there. So it was a long Long answer there, but um, I wanted to try and set the stage for the next few questions and, and really explain that in depth because I think sometimes that's challenging for people to understand. Okay. So riding off the coattails of that one, Jack says, I coach boys gymnastics and many of them really struggle to get their arms behind their back for pommel horse and parallel bar swings. Is there any way to fix this or is it an inherent problem with their arm length? So the first thing is that's a good little addition there on the end that says, is it a problem with their arm length? Some people unfortunately do have short arm dimensions that make it very challenging to get a good front uprise uh, or front pommel swing. So a little bit of a grain of salt there, but it's not so much that it can't be you know overcome. And this question I put intentionally behind the first one because the exact same situation will come up. It just matters for how we go about what exercises, right? So the same things apply, Jack. So one, screen your athletes out and see, is it a muscular problem? Is it a thoracic extension problem? Is it a pec length problem, a lat length problem, Terry's major? Is it a strength issue in the upper back and the triceps, right? Like sometimes athletes are really hypermobile when they're younger and they're just not strong enough to do some of the things they need. Okay, so I would do a screen first. Great medical providers or strength coaches who understand hu human movement science can break those things down and tell you kind of what's going on. After that, Again, some light daily soft tissue work, some foam rolling, some very specific stretching for those things that you need. I really like tabletop walks for these kids. So just on their body weight, push up into a nice high tabletop and walk forward nice and slow down the floor with a nice two second pause on each step to open up the front of the shoulders a little bit. Okay, I really like doing eccentrics as well for this. So put your butt or your feet on a slider, a furniture slider, push up into a nice table and do a five second lower with a five second hold when you get all the way into your front swing position, making sure your hands are turned kind of neutral so the wrists aren't extended and limiting um, the flexibility of the shoulders. But five reps of a five second lower with a five second hold, some sort of dynamic or uh, PNF or static stretching 
uh, every single day, up to six days per week um, for two, two rounds of 30 seconds. I would do these all on a circuit. If I had an athlete who I really found out needed some soft tissue work, I would have them do 30 to 60 seconds of foam rolling on their lats, their pecs, 30 to 60 seconds of tabletop stretches, uh, five reps of a five second lower with a five second pause. And then I would have them go do some sort of basics on pommels or P bars, five front swings, um, five open bucket circles, something like that to really go slow and use that new range of motion. I would do that circuit two to three times before practice. Cause that would be a good combination of everything in the research that we think is helpful, but it would also be something that's very consistently applied to gymnastics. So it's not like you're just going static stretch then you lose it 20 minutes later. Okay. So same kind of idea, but I would do those things specific to the pommel horse or P-bar swings that they need, okay? Um, third one here is from Ella. Uh, it says, what do you do for gymnasts who need extreme flexibility like rhythmic or who want to work over splits or advanced jumps and leaps like switch rings or switch sides? I've read your articles and I agree with them, but I don't know where to, what to do at practice to get these advanced jumps or leaps without causing hip injuries. So this is an awesome question and I'm happy to answer this one. Um, I think this also goes for like men's gymnastics with hyper uh, shoulder flexibility, right? Or, or women's gymnastics too, uh, but doing to pelts and moys releases like Kovacs is Chinese taps that require like 190 degrees of shoulder elevation. And then of course, in the hips for women, we have switch rings, we have all sorts of advanced jumps and leaps, switch sides, we have very uh, uh, over over splits, people want more than 180 for the leap angle. Um, so contrary to popular belief, I'm actually not against um, over splits, or against uh, more extreme uh, end range stretching in the proper context. Okay, so a couple layers here. One, if you are someone who is working with rhythmic gymnastics or has elite level gymnastics or it's level 10 that need extreme range of motion for their splits, you absolutely must understand the anatomy, you must understand common pain that they have versus what's normal soreness. And you have to understand how to screen those things out and figure out what is the problem. Okay, it's a personal responsibility of the person working with the athlete to keep them safe. Just like with gymnastic skills, that if you don't understand the anatomy, you don't understand the science of flexibility, you don't understand the science of strength conditioning, and you're applying drills that you randomly find online, that's on you if something goes wrong. Okay, so if you are ones who are doing this, and I've tried to put information out for this, is take the time to learn what goes into an oversplit. Okay, we need front leg hamstring flexibility, we need core control and core strength, we need back leg hip flexor, back leg quad, back leg adductor, we need glute strength. We need hip rotator strength. Okay. We need a lot of things, including a, a very naturally hypermobile person with shallow hip sockets to do this safely over time and not hurt them. Okay. So I don't mind somebody working over splits or advanced jumps and leaps, but they have to earn the right to do that. You have to treat it like a skill that you would teach over the course of maybe four to six months and slowly work on progressing it over and over and over, not just put everyone on a, on a panel mat and put their leg up and then put their arms up and have them hold for 30 seconds. All that's going to do is cause uh, guarding and, and, and kind of like protection. And if you hold it for a long time, you might start to damage some of the passive things like the ligaments, the bones, the joint capsules. I've unfortunately heard a lot of stories of people who are doing really aggressive oversplits and like hurt someone's hamstring, tore someone's hamstring off the bone, caused a partial tear of a hip flexor, caused a labral tear. That was very, very serious. Okay. And I think, again, you as a coach or as a parent or as an athlete or as a medical provider, you have to do the athlete the best service by understanding the anatomy, the physics, the biomechanics and stuff in the same way that if you're teaching a giant, you are responsible to know how to safely teach that and do the drills for that and progress that over time, not just say, hey, go try a giant and, and risk some risk somebody getting hurt. Okay. So if you do uh, progress over splits, well, a couple pieces of advice is I would try to make sure when you're training over splits that the person first has a full passive split on the floor, that the person is uh, mature enough to understand how to create core and hip and body tension. They're not just like flopping themselves and pushing themselves down when they might get hurt. And also, if you train them, try to make sure they're entire your front knee is up on a panel mat or a mat. Don't just put their heel up there because that might hyperextend their knee and put more stress on their ACL or the back of their kneecap. Okay. So lots of things to think about there. If you're training advanced jumps and leaps, try to make sure you're doing the proper active flexibility stuff and strength stuff first with tumble track jumps or therabands or hip rehab or nice strength and conditioning. Ballet is great. Like make sure you're doing things that require strength, not just swinging their legs up as hard as they can or doing some really aggressive switch ring jumps on the floor or needle kicks, right? Because if you just, if you swing your leg hard, that's a version of passive flexibility. You're not working to get your end range, you're cheating, right? You're swinging your leg very hard. There's a time and a place for that down the road when they master it. But when they're learning these things, you have to teach the control, teach the strength, okay? 
So drills I really like for this. I love doing um, uh, curled up hip lifts where they curl up on a mat and they lift their back leg up. I like doing slow needle kicks with pauses. I like doing TheraBand kicks front, side, and back. Um, start without TheraBands or start with the TheraBands assisting the motion and then take the TheraBands off and go gravity and then add the TheraBands down the road. I'm not a big fan of ankle weights for a number of reasons, if we can dive into that in another question later, but um, trying to make sure they're doing a lot of controlled hip circles. So up and over block locks up and over beams, um, standing needle kicks where they lift their top leg off, where they go standing with their legs behind or hands behind them on a beam, other legs up on a partner and they're lifting off and holding for 10 seconds. So those stuff is really great to develop the end range um, strength they need. Then you can start doing some more of the progressive jumps on tumble track, jumps on trampoline and try to work their way up to a nice split angle. Okay. So work on them two to three days per week do some sort of flexibility work every single day, try to make sure they're getting screened like the questions above, and then just slowly progress them over the course of a year. Don't just be like, hey, I found these new flexibility drills for over splits or leaps on YouTube. I want to try them. You throw them in at practice, everyone's hips get really, really sore because they're not used to it. Okay, The equivalent of, hey, I want to get you guys better at running. Let's go run five miles, right? Everyone's shins are going to hurt because you just probably you pushed it a little bit too aggressively. Okay. So hopefully all that helps. Uh, Jackie says, how do you implement your flexibility approaches in a group setting? It makes sense to me when I watch Shift's YouTube channel, but I have a group of 12 to 15 gymnasts at practice and it's just me coaching. We only usually have a small space for floor, a uh, small space of floor to do flexibility circuits. Okay. So fantastic question. Thank you for asking. Um, and yes, I know it's easier to show one person in a 20 minute video than at practice with a group of kids in front of you. So what I have found helpful, and this is the only thing I've tried a lot of different ways to do flexibility work here. The only thing that I have found helpful is to do um, lines down the floor of a number of different stations. Okay. So doing kind of a Congo line fashion and setting up multiple sets of the same station. Okay. So, so let's talk about a shoulder flexibility circuit. So say you want to get someone's shoulders more flexible. Like we said, we might do 30 to 60 seconds of a stretch. We might do 30 to 60 seconds of some sort of active flexibility drill. Then we might do five reps of eccentrics. Then we might go do some sort of drill that's technically developing shoulder flexibility, right? So maybe we do a PVC stick stretch and you can find these all on Shift's YouTube channel if you're confused, but a PVC stick stretch where your elbows are up, your palms are wide, you're hollow in your upper back and you're leaning back and stretching your upper back. 30 seconds of that, I would have the first station on the floor, say three sets or four sets of the same station. So four blocks with four bars. Each group has about five kids in it or four kids in it in this example for 12 and 15. Okay, so four lanes, each first station is the stick stretch. The second station is maybe some sort of active flexibility drill. So maybe we do a wall angel. Maybe we do some sort of a stomach circle uh, up to a panel mat. Maybe we do some sort of um, slider uh, crawl back backwards to get the shoulders to stretch out too, okay? Anything you can think of that you find useful and it works for a screen, that would be the second station. There'd be four sets of that station all in down a line. So one station is the stick stretch. The next station is the uh, shoulder flexibility, active flexibility. The third station might be on a low bar, a chin up eccentric. So jump up, five second lower, five second hold for five repetitions. Okay. The fourth set might be a jump cast handstand or a tuck knee handstand hold at the wall or a pike handstand hold on a block. Okay. So there's four sets of every station. So four kids would be going in the first station, four would be going in the second station, four would be going in the chin up station or would be going on the wall handstand and you rotate them through every 30 seconds. So 30 seconds to do everything that you need, 30 seconds for the pull-ups, you know, five repetitions of five seconds is about 30 seconds. Um, and you just would rotate them through that two times. So four stations, right? It's going to take probably realistically about five minutes or six minutes to get people to transition and do it two or three rounds through you're looking at 12 to 20 minutes depending on how many kids you have and how much space you have to set up lines so doing that kind of congo line fashion keeps all the kids moving and is really uh, a nice flow of, of science-based supported things and you're not just sitting there waiting for one bar sitting there waiting for go so i have found that that's probably the best way to do it is congo line fashion if they're older you can kind of give them a whiteboard assignment say here's the circuit for five things uh, go amongst yourselves and make sure you're doing it all. Then we're all going to come back together and do some jumps and some leaps, some kicks. We're going to go swing pommels. We're going to go swing P-bars to get some nice flexibility changes. But those two are kind of the only ones that I've realistically seen work. I've tried a lot of different ways and they always crash and burn. I've tried group led. I've tried all sorts of other stuff and it's a little bit of a nightmare. So I would go with the circuit approach, uh, Congo line fashion, or I would go with the kind of older group who can do their own assignment in partners of twos or threes, and they rotate around the gym to do it on their own. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, there are some videos on Shift's YouTube channel if you want to check out and see that in real life.
Okay. Uh, last one here comes from Kevin. So Kevin says, what does your approach to warmups look like? We sometimes only have 15 or maximum of 30 minutes for a warm up, And I feel like it's so overwhelming trying to get everything in we need. Okay. Uh, I really, I think this is a common question I get a lot. And so I wanted to put it in last. So I personally have always followed the same flow of warmups. That's kind of based on the flexibility research of what I said, I think um, we have some good evidence for. So I personally try to ask the athletes to come to practice five to 10 minutes early and do a full body rollout. So very quick, 30 to 60 seconds, along with monitoring. So roll your calves out, your hamstrings, your quads, your, your inner thigh, your lower back, your, your back, your shoulders, just get one of everything, right? Um, use the lacrosse ball, use the tiger tails so they can talk with their friends a little bit, catch up, get the, get the gossip out for the day. Um, and then we have people line up, kind of have a nice little like, Hey, how you doing? How's your day? All that kind of jazz announcements. And then the one thing I would recommend is you do not want to just start with a running warm up. Don't just like say okay break and go and everybody runs right that's like putting your car from first gear to third gear the goal of a warm-up is to go neutral i'm making a car analogy neutral first gear second gear third gear fourth gear fifth gear gymnastics okay so you're trying to slowly warm the body up you're not going to gain flexibility in a warm-up a warm-up is there to, to prep the available range of motion you already have, to get the heart rate up, to get the respiratory rate up, to get the blood flow going, to wake the nervous system up. It's not to get more flexible. So we're just trying to prep the available motion we have. Maybe later with those flexibility circuits we just talked about, you actually get more mobile. But for now, we're just trying to warm the body up. So I usually have the athletes start with just walking the laps down the floor. Laps for me are the best way to do this, but if you're stuck in a small space and you're doing a circle warm-up, one person leading, which is common, same kind of idea. Start with this. So just start with basic joint warm-up. So neck rolls, walking up and down the floor, neck rolls, wrist rolls, slow shoulder circles, um, ankle rolls, um, knee hugs, quad pulls, inner thigh uh, steps. Just get the joints moving themselves, okay? And then from there, you can do a little bit more of a dynamic part where they actually start swinging their arms. They start kicking their legs nice and light up and over the fences, um, needle or pike walk, something like that. Just get the joints going a little bit before you start, you know, running and doing impact. We would probably do that for like five minutes, walking up and down the floor, doing everything I just mentioned. Uh, and, and everybody would kind of be going at the same time. So it kind of keeps the flow nice and easy. Then I would start the running stuff. So jog down and back, skip down and back, side shuffle down and back, karaoke down and back, um, pogo hops down and back, single leg pogo hops down and back, all the stuff you would think is more traditional in the warm up, right? And that it serves for me is to get the blood flow going, get the heart rate up, get the respiratory rate up, kind of wake up the, the nervous system and kind of get them breathing heavy a little bit. We would do that for probably about five or so minutes. Then about five to 10 minutes, depending on 15 minutes or 30 minutes is going to be the more full dynamic warm up, right? So leg kicks, um, forward roll to straddle split, forward roll, left split, roll through, swim through, handstand, pike down, hold the pike, uh, roll to a backward pike roll again. Okay. Um, shoulder circles, bridges, all that kind of stuff in a nice fluid moving dynamic warm up, right? We sometimes throw in kicks. If we have some time there, we really like doing active flexibility here. We do all that stuff next in the dynamic warm up. Okay. Then if we have only 15 minutes, we usually try to spend the first 10 minutes on our events doing some sort of basics to continue the warm up. Right now we're in fourth gear and then we're going to fifth gear. So if we don't have a lot of time on the floor, we'll go to bars and do a, a strength warm up and then kip cast handstands in bars, tap swings, giants, beam, we'll do a beam complex, vault, we'll do a running warm up with some body shaping. You know, men's parallel bars would have a sequence they would do or a ring strength warm up or a pommel horse warm up. You can go about that way. Ideally, you have 30 minutes so you can do more. If you have the full 30 minutes, we would then go into gymnastics basics. So let's do some line handstand holds, some core work, V-ups, hollow hold, arch hold. We have a shaping complex of uppers, lowers, together with a stick we do every day. So hollow, arch, uppers, lowers, together, handstand hold, um, log rolls, back extension roll, staller downs, like a lot of gymnastics specific stuff. We would also do some plyometrics here when the nervous system is fresh. So high tuck jumps, uh, just like three or five laps of really high explosive plyometrics to kind of wake them up not like 20 minutes of cardio plyometrics i don't think that's useful but tuck jumps over boxes or uh, plyo boxes or you know some sort of basic tumbling we would also then do some jumping and landing mechanics so double leg uh stretch jump land toe ball heel land single leg jump and land we would do some basic breathing and some basic uh midline alignment stuff and then we would probably do some like back tucks handstand holds maybe some other basics with advanced athletes and we'd go to our events okay so Really doesn't matter whether I'm working with a preschool class and we're trying to get their body warm or working with like an elite international for consulting. 
always pretty much the same uh, approach to it. Obviously, preschool is more fun oriented. You're making it exciting. You're trying to have an enjoyable time. Elite International, a little more serious tone. You're trying to get things with much more discipline and perfection. So the spectrum is there, but the template is the same. And I've, I've from me being an athlete back in the day, all the way up to now, the work that I do consulting around the world, it's almost always the same kind of uh, approach to that kind of stuff. And if you are in a more uh, advanced uh, situation, I would probably then spend another half hour doing conditioning. So we would do a half hour dynamic warm up and then a half hour of like handstands, rope climbs, leg lifts, you know, plyometrics, all that kind of stuff. We would do, uh, my buddy Nick has this thing called the Daily Dozen, which is a fantastic thing to do for a half hour after the warm ups. Um, we would do a little bit more strength for athletes that are in the advanced tiers. Or we would go to events for athletes that are maybe don't have as much time in the gym. So, yeah, hopefully that is helpful. Um, I think those are again common things I hear all the time. So we really like to try to get more in depth questions through about that because it's like really hard to answer in a twenty minute you know conversation on uh, you know Instagram. Just like going through my messages, trying to answer quick. It's really hard to give specific advice about what shoulder flexibility exercises to do or what hip exercises to do when I don't know the person. I haven't met them. I haven't talked to them. I haven't assessed them. It's really challenging to do that and. Um, I don't want to lead people down the wrong path. I don't want to give them the wrong information. So I just kindly say, hey, I'm sorry, but I can't really do this. But I think opportunities like this where people ask a lot of the same question, I can maybe give more uh, nuanced five-minute answers and kind of dig into some recommendations. And I, and I think people really are enjoying these. So I'll keep doing them if people keep asking if they find them useful. So uh, next week, we're going to wrap things up with uh, a discussion on culture about you know how do you be happier at work? How do you deal with some motivation issues, some burnout issues, some, some athletes that are maybe having some attitude problems or parents that are really overbearing. Um, I get a lot of questions about that too as well. So next week we'll finish this up. Um, if you guys didn't catch the first ones, there's a couple other episodes on strength and conditioning and then injury management. So check those out if you missed it. If not, if you've been tagging along the whole three, thank you so much. I appreciate you being here and uh, we'll see you guys on the next episode, uh, the last one for next week. All right, take care.